I figured if Senator Grassley can do that, I can do that. See, now you have to be on the ball. You have to know that that was the Kavanaugh hearing, so he was the chairman. So. All right. So here's where we want to talk about the way of Christ, uh, and then we're going to look at some scripture here and complete. And then uh, next week is reading week, so I want you to read the, the Ortborg book. Uh, you probably have read some chapters already. You can finish it off next week between, you got like a, a two weeks here between the next lecture. So when you read that, and then we'll be looking into this book, the last two uh, lectures. Well, the, uh, the tremendous, oh, one other announcement uh, that I'll make, we'll have some brochures for you, but we're having a couple cultural things here. Uh, November 4th, uh, at 2 o'clock, we're having a, uh, a harpist uh, play and talk about harp uh, at 2 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon. So if those of you who are musically inclined or just inclined, um, uh, Rebecca Finkstie, is it? Finkstall. Finkstall, Finkstall, yeah. And uh, so she'll be playing, and then December 2nd, there'll be a carol fest. Um, Medieval Carol Fest on December 16th on a Sunday afternoon will be Roman Rudinetsky, the great pianist, will be playing an afternoon of Chopin and Liszt. So that should be, and if you've never heard anybody play Chopin and Liszt, you should come just for the pure aesthetic um, experience of that. I just want to tell you something. Roman yeah. says he has 11 fingers. Have you ever heard this? Watch. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, and 5 is 11. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, Karen, Karen Edwards is our uh, Director of Cultural <laughs> Ministries here, and uh, as a, was a professor at WashU, and um, uh, it should be quite spectacular. So, 2 to 4 on a Sunday afternoon. It's part of our new series uh, of uh, Sundays at St. John's. So. All right, uh, now, as Christians, uh, we come into a unique relationship with God. As you see this played out from the Old Testament into Christianity, you see how the knowledge of God has uh, been more and more revealed to people, and that's the prophets, uh, the later prophets, and the writings of the Old Testament, and then certainly in the New Testament, we see further and further revelation of God. In fact, the last book of the New Testament is called what? Revelation. <coughs> Meaning the unfolding or the revealing of, uh, of, of knowledge of God. Uh, now Christ is interesting because um, we have, we have a, a certain brand of Christianity, and those of you who have been with me in other courses know, that uh, historically, uh, Christianity could have taken two different tracks. Uh, remember, Christ dies at the age of 33, and it's not until, say, 20, 25 years after that that we have any writings about Jesus. The earliest writings are actually St. Paul's writings, not the Gospels. Normally, you think that the Bible is set up chronologically. It is not. Uh, the New Testament. So you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but actually most scholars would say that Luke, or I mean, excuse me, that Mark precedes Matthew, Luke, and John. So actually if we were chronologically to have edited the Bible, and remember this was edited and put together, and if you remember our discussions when we talked about the apocryphal Gospels, there were many Gospels, uh, not just these four, now, there's Gospel of Thomas, uh, there's, there's, there's num numerous other writings, let's say. And so the scholars, or the early rabbis, the early uh, religious leaders of our, of our faith, had to decide what books would be canonical. Now, canonical means what would be in the canon, or between, and that means between two covers. What is the official writings between this cover and this cover? And so these books were chosen by human beings. Again, the, book, the Bible didn't drop out of heaven already 
assembled and written. In fact, even the editing of the Bible was never set up originally with chapter and verse. It was just written. And certainly headings and subtitles were never there originally either. Those are all human additions to try to make this book more readable and put it into some sort of organizational structure. Uh, as you remember last time I, I mentioned the fact is that it's unfortunate that these subtitles actually were put in here, like the prodigal son. Because when they put those editorial notes in there, which was not part of the original uh, scriptures, when they put those titles in, they skewed us into a certain way of thinking about that writing, which may or may not have been the correct way to think about it. So in that example I used last time, just to reiterate again, uh, if we read it as the prodigal son, it's the whole story about the son that you know runs away with his inheritance, uh, squanders it in the pig the pig's thigh, returns to this estate, and gets sort of reinherited. <coughs> but had the audit editors put in there the story of a jealous son we would have focused our attention on the older brother who is put out because the father is giving all these things to the wayward son and the older brother is taking the punitive role saying well he doesn't deserve all that you know the son comes back from squandering everything and what does the father do he puts his best robe on takes his ring off puts his ring on they kill the calf, fatted calf and what's the older brother who's been very dutiful and, and done everything according to the T, and always been there for his dad, and all of a sudden the big celebration is for his wayward brother. And so typically in human life, the brother gets jealous and says, this is not right, it's not fair, right? So had we had the title, and, and I could <coughs> tell you the, the meaning of all this, but let's just for this purpose just say, had the title been The Jealous Brother, we would have had a whole different interpretation in most sermons of that particular scripture. Or suppose, for example, it had been titled, The Loving Father. Now the focus comes on the father's role, not on the wayward son and not on the jealous brother. So you see what happens here. Just by putting a title, we forever have talked about, here's one. Can you ever think of Thomas without thinking of doubting Thomas, right? But he's the one that said, yeah, they're going, we're not going to Jerusalem. We're not going to go to right. Jerusalem. They want to kill you there. And Thomas right. says, let's follow him and die with him. That's right. That's right. Hardly a doubter. Forget that part of the Right. Promise. Hardly a doubter. In other words, we've been conditioned by editorializing, which had nothing to do with the original scriptures. Interesting. So when, you know, when my grandmother wouldn't allow me to put a newspaper on the Bible, she was thinking of it in a different way of thinking of the scriptures as being so holy that it dropped out of heaven. But the reality is that these are edited. Edit uh, now that doesn't make them in, you know, uh, it doesn't take away one iota from it. It just says that we have to be much more aware of the subtleties of interpretation, right? And not get skewed off uh, inappropriately. So, now let's look at Jesus. Now, it's very interesting that, and I said, mentioned this earlier, had James uh, been the eventual leader of Christianity far beyond New Testament times, his influence, we would have been a sect of Judaism. Why was this? James was, as far as we know, and most scholars agree, the brother of Jesus. Now, whether he was the anatomical brother of Jesus or uh, a stepchild, uh, being that Joseph perhaps was married before. You know, there's all kinds of ways people are, can skew that. But the point is that he grew up in the family of Jesus. Mm -hmm. James. Now, if James grew, grew up in the family of Jesus, no one would have known Jesus' teaching better than his own brother. So, who did the disciples, the apostles, choose as the successor of Jesus? You know, succession means a lot. In any corporation, you, uh, in big corporations, the successor is very important to carry on the tradition of the former leader, right? 
Uh, Kim Jong-un is the successor of his father, uh, whatever the name was there. There's another, um, um, ba, whatever. Okay, in other words, succession, line of succession. So James is chosen by the apostles. Now, now here, you probably never thought of this. Think of this. James, brother of Jesus, was not one of the apostles. There was a James, right? Right. James and John, sons of Zebedee, right? Sons of Zebedee, right? But not sons of Joseph. So all those apostles who would normally have been thought of, including Peter, as the appropriate successor to Jesus. After all, Jesus dies in this horrible tragedy, in this event which just goes, look at the split. In three days he's gone and all of a sudden they're in complete, uh, you know, they don't know what to do. Should we stay in Jerusalem? Should we go back to the hometown? Should we go back to our fishing? Some say, well, we better go back to our nets. It's all over, it was good while it lasted. And others, uh, you know, were, they were in complete quandary. So they had to have someone pull this whole thing together. And interestingly, who do they choose? James. Why? He's the brother of Jesus. Now, Jesus, to show you the significance of James, and some of you have studied this with me, James becomes the first bishop of the church, first leader. And which, where does he go? He is the bishop at Jerusalem, the holy city, the most important place of all. If you would say, where is the center of Roman Catholicism, you would say Rome, right? You wouldn't say East Liverpool, right? <laughs> Nothing wrong with East Liverpool, but, but you know where the source of power is, right? It's Rome. Uh, so when you're thinking of the holy city, there's no place, I mean, Corinth, Thessalonica, you know, uh, any of these places that Paul founded, Ephesus and so forth, these were important little cities, Alexandria and so on, but the most important place was Jerusalem. And so where would you put the head of the church, the new church, the followers of Jesus? In the holy city. And that's James. So what I said earlier, had the temple not fallen and James not been killed, we probably would have been a sect of Judaism, in other words, a further revelation, expansion of Judaism, because Jesus was in the line of David, right? Mm -hmm. And we accept the Jewish scriptures as part of our holy writings. So it wasn't just like that was then and this is now, but it was tied together. However, James is killed, the original community at Jerusalem dissipates, and then Peter, becomes into the ascendancy because he now is at the next great center of power, which is at Rome. And we then become Petrine Christians, or under the leadership of Peter, and then most influenced probably by Paul. A lot of people will say that, that we are Pauline Christians. In other words, because the majority of the New Testament was written by the letters of Paul, uh, Paul has influenced us probably more than anybody else. So, if we look at the authentic Jesus, you know, there was a movement that I've talked about before called the Quest for the Historic Jesus. That is, what can we say about Jesus that we can be assured of? And this has been debated by people like Albert Schweitzer, by Bauer, by all these great uh, thinkers, uh, over, the, over the years, particularly the German theologians and so on, to try to get back to origins. Now to do so, they say, okay, let's look at what the earliest writings are, because the earliest writings should be as close to the source as possible. So one of the first writings is Pauline, but the earliest gospel, we believe, to be Mark. Okay. Now why do we think that's the earliest gospel? because it is fragmentary. It is the briefest, it's the, most, uh, it's the most fragmentary in its writings. It looks as if, scholars believe, that 
Matthew and Luke probably had Mark in hand. And when they looked at Mark, they saw that Mark was deficient in some of the things contained therein. Example, there is no birth story in Mark. Now, if Mark is the earliest gospel, and it looks very much like, I mean, all credible scholars will agree that Mark is probably the first. There's no birth story in there. So Matthew and Luke come along, and they look at this and say, well, yeah, hey, gee, uh, Mark left out an important thing. We better put a birth story in. And so now Matthew and Luke contain birth stories. However, John has no birth story, essentially. No shepherds. No Bethlehem, that kind of thing. So at Christmas, you're reading Matthew or Luke, mostly Luke, because that's what the hymns usually are based on, Lukean writings. But Mark doesn't have any birth story. And furthermore, Mark at the end has very little to talk about post-resurrection. It ends very abruptly. Either the end was cut off or, uh, or it wasn't considered as significant. So it's very interesting how the Gospels begin to, sh to center us on the historic Jesus. So now what can we say about Jesus? We can say that he was an itinerant preacher. That is, he came from backwater Galilee, not a significant place, uh, and that he lived a very humble life. He was not born of royalty. Uh, and he was born of a carpenter's son, which was a noble profession, actually. We have a reference to Jesus in his earliest years, but we lose him up until the age of about 12 or 13. He appears in the temple, and he reads from the Torah. And then we lose him completely from the age of 12, 13, up until the age of about 30. Most historical scholars will say that Jesus died at about 33 years old, at the, age, at the date of 30. Now that's interesting because the calendar was not the same then as it is now. So it actually means that Jesus was actually born, get this, at 3 BC. Uh, well that doesn't make too much sense, does it? Because we always said before Christ or after Christ, AD, BC or so on. But in those days the calendar wasn't the same. And so we think he was born about 3, 4, 8, before, before zero. And so therefore he died at the year of 30, but he was 33 years old. So that's how you get back to that. Now, we also know that he was familiar enough with the scriptures that he must have been literate, that he could read, because otherwise he would never have been able to read the scriptures in the temple, okay? And interpret them. The other thing we know is that, uh, that he must have been trained in scriptures and so on, either at, at a synagogue school, uh, under the tutelage perhaps of a rabbi, or even more likely, probably at, the, at his mother's knee or his father's workbench. <coughs> we know that his father was a tectone, they called it, which meant a skillful carpenter and actually a, a carpenter of furniture manufacture. Wouldn't it be neat if I could say, hey, look at this, folks. Joseph of Galilee made this, okay? but unfortunately, 2,000 years tends to destroy wood, and so we don't have any references, but there's oblique references to Jesus uh, being trained at the carpenter shop. We also know that Jesus um, uh, was uh, an extraordinarily effective evangelist, meaning that he must have had a charismatic personality. Somebody that you were immediately drawn to because, you know, people left their nets, they left their families, you know, all kinds of stuff. He must have been a guru of all gurus, you know. I mean, he must have really, people would have said, you looked into his eyes and they were magnetic, you were just drawn into him. What was really being said there is, you saw God in Jesus. Remember what I said before the break, is that as we emulate God, as we move in the sphere of God, as we become more God-like in our lives, God becomes more reflective through our lives to other people. That's why there are some people you are drawn to. I call it vibes. You know what I mean? 
good vibes. There are people you want to be with or associate with or you are in their company you enjoy because you know that they have something that you would like yourself to have. A quality of life. It's that unflappable nature. It's that ability to handle things gracefully and not get all bent out of shape. It's the kind of thing that happens when you say, if only I could be more like them. Now imagine the most ideal of ideal, that being Jesus. If only I could be more like Jesus. So I can see James and John, sons of Zebedee, all the rest being drawn that Jesus has something unique that other people do not have, and I want to have what he has. Now notice, and this is important, that Jesus puts no limitations or no rules, regulations, qualifications in place. What does Jesus do? Uh, let's, let me hear you recite the Apostles' Creed. Uh, you got that wrong. You can well, work on it a little bit, and then you can be one of my believers. No. There were no creeds, nothing written down, no doctrines, no stumbling blocks, no confirmation exams. When I was a kid, you know, I, that was fear of God was in us when we went through confirmation. Because you had to appear before the board and be grilled, right? Uh, name the books of the Bible in order within five seconds. <laughs> Yes, sir. I mean, you know, it was something you hated or resisted, that type of... Isn't it interesting that when somebody came to Jesus, all he said was, what? Follow me. Now, isn't that interesting? What he's essentially saying, as you see me, later on he'll say this in, in, the, in the Gospels, as you see me, you see the Father. Right? So, true evangelism, at its very best, is to set an example such as others will want to have what you have. People wonder why churches don't grow. There must be something toxic in those congregations that people, when looking at it, say, boy, I wouldn't want that. They're all a bunch of hypocrites. Or, they're sitting in judgment, judgment you know. My hair is too long. I'm not wearing the proper clothes. He's wearing shorts. Uh, he's wearing flip-flops. Uh, if he was a respectable Christian, he would dress appropriately. I don't remember Jesus saying one thing like that. Uh, in fact, back in the hippie eras, hippies uh, used to say, okay, mom, quit criticizing my hair. Look at Jesus' picture. <laughs> remember? And Jesus' hair was shoulder length. Well, that shut the conversation down pretty fast. But the point was that Jesus had something that people saw in him. It was God coming through. So, one of the things that we see in the way, and I, I'm choosing, notice I have the way of Christ, in parentheses, is because the early Christians were not called Christians. Early followers of Jesus were called the people of the way. S Historic Lutheran Church of St. John, the people of the way. Now what's the way? That's interesting, isn't it? We could say the way is the way of God, right? People who are on the journey, notice how Jesus, Jesus doesn't set up shop in the synagogue. He doesn't set up, he doesn't say, well, that would be a good place to set up, have a building. He doesn't set up any sort of specific time or place. He says, come and see. Even St. Paul says that. If people will see how much you love one another, they will be inclined to join. That's what Paul's formula for evangelism is set such an example of love and compassion that people will be beating down the doors to come in. Generosity, hospitality, so what we call it hospitality. See, Jesus, what he's saying is, just, it's the way. 
The way that, remember he quotes that. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Right? Isn't it interesting? Now, what is the way? The way is into the heart of God. What is the, what is the objective of us as people of God and followers of Christ? Is to become more Christ-like. As to be people on the way and be drawing closer and closer into the heart of God. And it's more than just head knowledge. It's heart knowledge. See, you can learn, and I've said this often, and you know it, I can teach anybody, I can teach any atheist the Ten Commandments, the Apostles' Creed, and they can recite it back, word for word, jot for jot, and make no mistakes, but have no concept of what it means, and believe not one word of it. So, so to have creeds and all this, and I'm not against creeds by any means, because they are statements of faith, but the point being is that as you... As you make this journey of faith in your Christian life, the objective is to draw closer into the heart of God so that God becomes the, the reflection of God is lived in and through you. Because what did we say? God made this whole world for us with the sole purpose that we would be the hands and the heart, the voice of God in this place. If we do not do it, it will not be done. We are often placed, and my congregation knows this well, we are placed in situations every day of our lives in which we have the opportunity to reflect the heart of God. It can be in the checkout counter at, at, the, at the Giant Eagle. When everybody's frustrated, bitchy and complaining, you can be the leaven in the loaf. And you can say, after everybody's complaining about the bad service, or about this, or about that, and they're all listening to the wrong voice, remember the two ears, we have two ears, because we can hear the devil in one, and we can hear God in the other, it's who you tune. I always say I need a bell tone, you know, one of those old hearing aids, you know. <laughs> tune it in, tune it out, okay? You can be the leaven in the loaf. Have you seen that experience? where everything is chaos, and then somebody will come in, and all of a sudden the tension level lowers, and all of a sudden people begin to smile and laugh where they were bitching and in, in, in like this. And what was that? That was the presence of God coming to ameliorate the negativity which Satan or evil has placed in the situation. So the way is Jesus is saying, forget all the, the, you know, the disqualifications, because not one of those apostles were qualified by our measure. Uh, they did not have the proper education. Uh, they were, I mean, look at Peter. Look at how many times he gets it wrong. And Jesus is always correcting him. But Jesus didn't cast him out. He brought him in. Jesus is in the inclusion business. The devil is in the exclusion business. See, Jesus never used qualifications. He never asked out how much money anybody had, whether they'd be a good contributor to the, to the church. He didn't ask whether they had a good voice so they could sing in the choir. He didn't ask what their track record was, what they had done in the past. In fact, he never had any kind of employment uh, credentials that he required. People would say, you know, I'd like to find out more about God. And he'd say, well, come and, come and look, come and follow in fact, all the people, that's interesting, the New Testament is replete with people of all different staff. You know, the centurion comes, the wealthy man comes, the beggar comes, the prostitute comes, and so on. Jesus is comfortable with everybody in every situation and never looks at those as disqualifiers, but seekers. So, when you think about Jesus, he's moving from this heavy law-based Judaism to a much more warm and compassionate way of looking at God, using the law appropriately when it is appropriate, and then developing this whole business of an encounter with the divine.
Now, see, most people, as we've gone through religious faith and religious traditions, are head learners. And I'm certainly in the business of head learning. I mean, that's, you know, being a professor all these years, that, that's very important to me. But if you stop there with head knowledge, you will never get into the full presence of God. Because the heart and the soul and the mind are different. It's the softer things, it's the encounters, there's the experience of living that begins to mold and shape us. Anybody that's had a close encounter, not with the third kind or whatever, <laughs> close, the close encounter with a severe illness and you made it through, you are a different person. Anyone who has ever been loved and felt loved in life by someone that has been the love of your life, you're a different person. Anyone that has had a real friend that has been there through thick and thin and who hasn't abandoned you when others have run because it wasn't politically correct will never be the same. It's experience. It's living of life that begins to mold and shape you into the people you are. What God desires of us is, is to walk with him in every way. To think about God more than just on a Sunday morning or more than just a casual afterthought when everything else has failed and then you say, well, I better turn to God because I've tried everything else. It's kind of an insult, you know. It's, it's sort of like your child or whatever, you know. They go to all the neighbors asking for something and then they finally come back to you, you know. Well, why didn't you come here? I would have given it to you, you know. So, so the point is, is that this whole spiritual journey, which we're attempting with this course and will go on with others, is to begin to be a friend of God. To know God in such a way that your whole life takes on a different attitude or a different affectation, meaning the whole way of your living. That is, to see God not as an enemy or to be frightened by God, but to see God as a companion, a loving father, a best friend, the lover of your life, who is always there with you through thick and thin, who never, who ne there's nothing you can do in life that God will say, that's it, that's it, you've done it, gone, bye, gonzo. God comes back and back and back. You know, that image I love of the knocking on the door. Remember that old painting, you know, the knocking on the door? You know, knock and it shall be opened unto you. Look at that. God is persistent. God will pursue you because you are the object of his affection. He made you. He designed you. He created you. He put you in your mother's womb. He brought you into life. You are a companion with God. And that's a whole different way of thinking about God. Not to be afraid, not to be feeling that God is judging you or, or condemning you. God certainly doesn't like it when you do something wrong, when you disobey and, and do something stupid. But God is this incredible lover. That's agape love. You know, we, you've maybe heard that expression in church. God who loves you in spite of yourself. And that's really good. Because if God were a conditional lover, we would always have him to be worried about shaping up. See, conditional love says, if you live the way I tell you to live, you're okay and I'll love you. But if you deviate from what I, forget it, you're gonzo. The agape love of God is that we will abuse the relationship. We will offend God by what we do and say. But nevertheless, God is not willing to abandon us in spite of it. And he wants us to draw closer to him in knowledge and in affectation and in living. So Jesus says, people say, well, how do, I, how do I know, how do I find God? And Jesus says, walk with me. 
and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. But the joy we share that will tarry there, none other has ever known. That's not bad. Not bad at all. I mean, your voice is that. Is. <laughs> no, but, but think of it. That's exactly what it is. It's, it's, it's ability to be so comfortable with Jesus, your Lord, that you begin to envision God all the time. He becomes a constant companion. Now, this is an amazing thing. Because sometimes we think, God only, I can only be with God when I'm at church between 10.30 and 11.30. But God is everywhere. He will be there when you pet your dog tonight, when you cuddle with your cat. And the joy you find is God says, yeah, yeah I made that cat. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, you need that cat in your life, and I'm happy that you're happy. See, God's happy when you're happy. God's unhappy when you're unhappy, because that's not the way things are supposed to be. God wants joy, and he wants happiness, and he wants all things to work together for good. Remember that statement? All things work together, meaning I'm trying to make everything well. The only problem in the mix is you make it, you mix it up and mess it up. I've got it all planned out, you know, we're going, to, we're going to Albany this weekend or something, and all of a sudden you change your plan and say, no, I want to go to Akron. You know, I said, well, I made all the plans for us to go to, to Albany. I've got the motel reserved and, uh, you know, no, I want to go to Akron. Uh, you know, I'm talking about human life now. And uh, you say, well, okay, why are we going to Akron rather than Albany? Well, I want to see, you know, I want to see the, the flyers or whatever. And you say, okay, well, I guess if that's where you want to go, oh, that's where I want to go. Well, see, we do that with God all the way. God has all, it all mapped out in a nice way, and then we throw the kibosh into it, okay? And, and, but God doesn't say, well, you know, if you're not going to Albany, then forget it. I'm not going any place. Do you go to Akron on your own? Now, I'll just sit here and pout. But God says, okay. Okay, I'll go to Akron with you, but you know, uh, okay, because I want to be with you. See, to be with somebody often precludes where we're going, right? It's just the part of, of the wonderful thing to be with somebody. You know, uh, Cindy just got back from her wonderful uh, grandchild's birth in Buffalo of all places, you know, uh, and, but, and you know, it, it, it takes, what, four or five hours to drive, three hours, well, you drive a lot faster than I do, I see. okay, remind me not to ride with you, Cindy, <laughs> no, but here's the point, why does Cindy take, it? works all week, tired, Friday night, she gets up, she drives to Buffalo, why? She wants to be with her grandchild, right? She wants to share the enjoyment and the excitement of the first little cries of that little thing, right? That little baby, Mia, right? Mia. Mia. And she is made better for that relationship, right? She's had joy in her heart. She knows that, and she, I mean, it tr brings you to tears, well, doesn't it? Well, in she's like part of my soul, my first granddaughter. There you go. You know, it's right. just, there's such a connection. Right, right. Yeah. And so God is like that, too. Think about God like that. He wants to be with you in all your endeavors, in good and bad and whatever we get messes we get into. God wants to be there to help solve the problem, work with us, be included in, share the joy with, laugh together. It's a whole different relationship that Jesus brings into, into the picture than this, you know, meanie, mean-spirited, gotcha, can't wait to destroy you, into a view of God that is a companion in, in mutual relationship. So the way of Christ is to begin to try to develop within you the, the qualities of, or the essence of, a loving heart, a loving spirit. 
You know, in 1 John, it says, God is love. Whoever abides in love, what? Abides in God, interestingly. So when I say, well, how do I, how do I draw close to God? There's your answer. The more loving I am, the more I'm willing to set my interests aside for the welfare of someone else, the more generous I become, the more forgiving I am, all those wonderful warm qualities, the more compassionate I am, the more forgiving, the kinder I am, the more merciful I am, I'm drawing into the heart of God. For whoever loves is in God, and God is in them. It's very simple, isn't it? It says nothing about a Nicene Creed or an Apostle Creed, not that those aren't important, but now we're getting to the real essence of what religion and spirituality are. That is a relationship with the God who has made himself personable in the person of Jesus Christ. Not the austere, yes, he still remains the creator of heavens and earth, he's created it all, but for one purpose, to be in relationship, loving relationship. He didn't need to make human beings. He made human beings because he, lo he loves companionship. To deny God your companionship is to deny, to deny God his pleasure and his joy. And there are ways to achieve that companionship of which we're going to be dealing with uh, in this course. <clears throat> so let's see uh, the last thing on number seven. The journey begins into this heart of God in Sabbath. Now that's interesting because we might have thought of many other ways that we could have started the journey into the heart of God or the heart of God journeying into us to become more loving and more affectionate and so on. But it's really in Sabbath because that's the first thing that God tells us after the creation in Genesis. What does God do? He rests. Why does, it, you know, when, uh, when people rest, sometimes they say, I just need a little bit of time to regroup. Marianne Fund, dear Marianne Fund, uh, Janet, one of our dearest friends, used to say, I've got to regroup. And I knew exactly what she meant, is I need some downtime just to get my thoughts in my heart, you know, get, I'm so much on a treadmill that I'm just sort of, you know, it's like the fast freight to Omaha. You know, it never stops. You can't get off, you know, the treadmill. And because our lives are so complex, you know, uh, who isn't looking at their iPhone just every minute? Uh, who isn't checking their email? Who doesn't expect a response back immediately? Uh, you know, who talk, puts on the TV the first thing you go into the house? Who sees all the work that we have to do tomorrow? Who carts all the work home that we didn't get done today? And so on. And, and God says, you need to sort of step back a bit and pause. Now the Sabbath is the way a Jew will claim his religion. To observe the Sabbath is to proclaim to others your faithfulness. Now this is interesting. Someone said, a Jewish writer once wrote, I would never buy a car from a Jewish car dealer who did not observe the Sabbath. Because if that car dealer was selling cars on Sunday, or on, for them on, on the Sabbath Saturday, or if he wasn't an observant Jew, what they call an observant Jew, that is not just in name only, but actually, you know, it's like us, you know, how many people have their names on the roll of the church? but never darken the door, so to speak. But he said, I would never buy a car from a non-observant Jew. An observant Jew meant someone who observes the Sabbath. Why? Because I could not trust him. If he fails, if he does not trust God enough to observe his ordinances or his laws, how can I trust him in civil matters, right? Because what he's saying is, your priorities are all screwed up. In other words, you're chasing the dollar and you have to be open even on the Sabbath because 
you put a little bit more money in the, in the kettle, but your priority should be your relationship with God first, and everything else is second. Now you see, what I quote here in, at St. John's on the, on the, every Sunday, as we begin the service, Hear, O Israel, the Lord God is one. That is the, the formula of Judaism. But most importantly, it's Jesus' summary of the great law. You shall, listen to this, you shall love the Lord God with all your soul, with all your heart, and with all your mind. For this is the first and great commandment. Now listen to that. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like unto it, that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. For truly on these two great commandments hangs the message of all the law and the prophets. Meaning that if you know nothing else and know these things and live them out, you are drawn into the heart of God. To love God with your whole heart and soul and mind and to love your neighbor as yourself. It says nothing about all the other stuff of our human life. So it's a matter of priority. If your human life has, has consumed you in busyness, in <coughs> frustration, in fretting, in a treadmill that you can't get off, your priorities are all fouled up. If you can take a day off and turn the TV off, uh, you can uh, turn the Twitters off from the White House, <laughs> or the tweets or whatever. If you can put your cell phone on mute, if you cannot read your email, because they can wait until tomorrow, if you can have a nice day with the people you love, doing nice things together, a walk in the park, eating a good meal together, taking a nice drive, calming down, worshiping together in a good church with a positive message that you go out feeling better than you came in. That's a good way to measure it. If you feel lousy when you left, don't go there. If you can go and you feel enriched, enlivened, fulfilled, filled, and go out of the church knowing that you have been in the presence of God and that you will continue in the presence of God every moment of your life. If you can get to the place where you feel God close to you, where you feel that you are not alone as you're driving home tonight if you're by yourself, and you actually feel that there's a presence in that car with you. If when you're in prayer, you feel that indeed you're not just talking into the air, but that there is somebody that's listening, and then you give time to hear a response back. You know, one of the problems we have, and you've heard me say this before in our worship uh, thing, is that it's too, we talk too much in church. There's too much blab. We fill every second with somebody doing something. Either the minister talking, the choir singing, the lector reading, the announcer announcing, and there's no quiet time. To be in God's presence demands the quietness to hear Him. What does the Bible tell us? A still, small voice. Still, small voice means really hard to hear. Got to have a little silence here turn off the radio, and so on. You need time with yourself. You remember uh, Pastor Klinker that was here that talked about different ways of meditation and so on, is that one of the things is that to, to structure into your life downtime with no agenda. That would be like going to the park for an hour. And that's it, I'm going to the park I'll talk to you when I get back. And just sit and think. I can do this driving. One of the reasons that I, I love to drive 
is that I, I, I talk to God when I'm driving. Now, not like some people talk to God when they're driving. You know. <laughs> not like that. Not like that. There's no hell mentioned in, in my, in my drive. But it's my time away from the telephone, the cell phone, the radio, everything. And I begin to look around and I see these beautiful verdant hills. I see a sunset and everything. And I, and I, I try to recapture the wowness. Wow, this is awesome. Or, you know, my kids always say, awesome. That's awesome, Rev. You know, but what, I'm, what I mean, that wonder, that sense of wonder. Did you ever, re did you ever think what Jesus means, uh, and that actual text is coming up here, it came up, when he says, lest ye be like a little child, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now what's that mean? Does that mean to be stupid? No, not at all. Does it mean to be whiny and cranky? No, of course not. What he means by that is, um, it, when you have lost, the sense of wonder and excitement of the creation of God, to be able to be embraced by somebody and feel the goodness of that embrace, you have lost that sense of childlikeness. Isn't that interesting? See, this journey is about heart. It's about drawing into the heart of Jesus God or this divine spirit and the way we do it is with one another. There is really nobody that can say a Christian, a Christian is a Christian all by himself. Can't be done. You have to be in community. That was the beauty of God putting the church together. That we share our experiences one another. I bet if I went around this room, I could ask you, is there someone in your life that changed your life. And I bet there's just every one of you would say, yeah, there was a coach I had, there was a teacher I remember, there was a Sunday school teacher, there was my aunt, or whoever, that made a tremendous difference in my life. She turned me around, put me on the right path, sent me in the right direction. Have you ever had somebody that you think about who has said something and then it comes back into your mind and you say, gee, I, I didn't think about that at the time, but that was really, really important, what they said. So we have to, and what we're going to be doing in these couple weeks, and maybe even beyond, is we're going to look at all the ways and means we can do to get in touch with the God who wishes to love us in an incredible way. Sometimes it's a matter of just tuning in rather than tuning out. You know, when I go home tonight and I'll put on 21, so let's say channel 21, uh, I have to tune the right channel in, otherwise I can't get it, right? If I'm on 33 and I want 21, it makes no difference for me to yell at the TV, why aren't you have 21 on? Uh, dummy, change the channel, get tuned in. Okay, sometimes I think God is saying, oh, you're so, you people are so hard, hard, you know, hard-headed. You know, just tune, tune the dial a little bit. Be a little bit more sensitive. Fine-tune, and, and, and it'll come into awareness. So finally, uh, on that journey with Sabbath, is to think of God is in, in a vital connectedness with God attempting in silence or in worship to have an experience of God. You know, every time I celebrate the Eucharist here at St. John's, I really believe, and I'm not just saying this, you know, in an academic way, I really believe that God will encounter us in that Eucharist, in that breaking of the bread. Why? Because as you know, those of you who have been with me as students know, that in the breaking of the bread, what? They realized that they were in the presence of God. That same mystery is there. Church should have mystery. You should, ha you should come to church with high expectations. And my expectation is that people's lives will be changed by being here. That somebody will be touched, and many people will be touched by the hand of God and the love of God. I see it at the communion room. You don't see it, I do. 
I see people that kneel there and all of a sudden the tears just gush out of their eyes and they're overwhelmed and they'll come to me and they'll say, I don't know what happened today, Pastor. I just, I was just overwhelmed. I felt this warmth come over you. And I said, yeah, I felt like saying, praise the Lord. That's exactly what happened. The Holy Spirit was descending upon you like the gift from heaven. I truly believe that you can encounter the presence of God. Many thousands and millions have experienced it, and you can do it too. It's a matter of fine-tuning, opening your heart, understanding how and why God wants to be in relationship to you, and to love God with your whole heart and soul and mind. And when you do, you will find a joy in your step. You'll find that negativity has fallen off like the fetters. Let's see, that's an old-fashioned word. Uh, and that you will have a totally different view. You will go so excited into each day because you'll know that today will be a day that I will be in the presence of God and I will meet God in a special way and somebody else in a situation I've called to. Every day of my life, I can't wait to get going because I know that God will make his presence known to me. And hopefully this is what the Christian journey is really all about and the excitement of what we share here in this holy place. And with that, the people of God say, Amen. Amen. Let us stand for the Lord's Prayer, our benediction. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. strong and of good cheer. Render unto no man evil for evil, but always hold fast to that which is good. And so may the blessings of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit bless, preserve, and keep you this eve and forevermore in his love and his peace. Journey well, my friends. Journey well. No, we don't need